Um, I, I Perfect. Thanks, Jesse. Very punctual. <laughs> All right. Welcome everybody to our CTIP CAN call for the month of April. We are delighted to be with you on what is a gorgeous day here in the DC area. And as you enter this space, I'd invite you to share in the chat where you're joining from and you know anything else you wanna share as you join this space that we will share for the next hour or so. Anything you want to uplift in the world that you're working on, anything that you want to just say into our chat is welcome. Um, um, and so as you all check in with that chat feature, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start sharing some slides for today. Move my Zoom screen, can't see anything there. All right. And so, you know, on this slide, as you may have read, as you, uh, if you got here by way of our newsletter or social media, you'll see that we'll be facilitating a connection today around trauma-informed workplaces and workforce wellness. So in terms of what you can expect during this hour today, we're going to talk a bit about our new toolkit and its content before we dive into our activity and discussion that will be centered on topics related to workforce considerations and workforce wellness. And then at the end, pending that there's enough time, we'll open the floor for you to share what you're thinking about and wondering about um, and what you might want to share with the full group, as well as um, just engage in an optional resilience practice to set you up to go about the rest of your day. And as we are working to make these just one hour sessions versus 90 minutes, just wanted to let you know that um, we value your time and we acknowledge Zoom fatigue. So we're gonna dive in quickly up front to just set the table um, that I'm facilitating today and get into the connection piece, um, which is really what's special about these meetings and what we're trying to anchor in and create the time and space for. So again, we want to lift up that we have a toolkit that was released this month that is available on the CTIP website and which I will, or Jesse will link to in a moment that we invite you to peruse. jesse has got my back today with a lot of links that we're gonna be sharing throughout the time together. Um, and I just wanna take pause before we get started to really acknowledge the people who made this possible, including Sandy Bloom, who among other significant accomplishments, of course, is our CTIP board chair. Renisha Crawford, who is the brilliant CEO of the Trauma Informed Institute and a specialist when it comes to implementing sustainable trauma informed workplaces, and Kate Manning, who is an attorney and coach who has written a highly recommended book called The Empathetic Workplace. Um, these three individuals really lent their beautiful words, their good thinking, and their wisdom and lived experience and expertise to support this piece from the start of its inception. So I I really want to extend my gratitude to them. And I also want to thank the, the folks from um, Trauma-Informed Champion Collaboratives that I had the opportunity to work with in Westchester and Allegheny County, New York. Um, you can find their exemplars, some of the great work that they have been doing and what they've accomplished to draw inspiration from um, in the toolkit and some of the activities that they've implemented to inform their organizational and community-wide change can really be models for for some of doing this work. And so just really wanna uplift our gratitude for those folks and those groups of people. And so diving into just some of the primary takeaways from this toolkit up front before we get into the discussion. Um, if you're on this call, you probably have a good idea about the why, right? Um, always of importance though, in is is a particularly um that we're in a particularly critical time right given that all that keeps happening in the world and in our lives and those of us on this call tend to be acutely aware of what is making this particularly urgent um and so the toolkit covers some of these key points in depth again I'm not going to lecture you on this call because you're here to talk about these things um and you know, I, I'm aware that folks in our network often wake up thinking about all of this and are, again, just very aware of all that is continuing to happen. Once you see this lens and this way of thinking and being and doing, it's very hard to unsee things through that lens. Um, I want to mention, though, that these and a great many other statistics and facts and data and stories and perspectives and a lot of links to a lot of different resources are included in the toolkit because it's critical that we recognize that not 
everyone is as aware of the interconnectedness of stress and adversity and trauma and the experiences and outcomes that we see in the workplace and among the workforce as those of us on, on this call tend to be. And so depending on your setting, um, you may find some talking points in the toolkit to inform what advocacy looks like in your work setting to really bring awareness to whatever you know as the expert of your setting is coming up, whether it's you know being expected to do more with less as we so often hear in the field, people expressing that they just feel burned out, lower performance because folks are having trouble concentrating and showing up fully, um, compassion fatigue, trouble keeping talented people with lived experience on board because they don't have the supports that they need. You know, there's a lot covered there for you to really explore and dig into on your own time. Um, and it all really serves to support the argument that there is a need for us to shift our paradigm um, in our workplaces overall, because we know that when we are within workplaces that strive to be trauma informed, we can transform the way that we work, um, creating space where everyone feels valued and respected and understood. We can break down the barriers that separate us and build bridges of connection and compassion, um, creating a workplace that's truly a supportive community where each person is seen and heard and where healing is possible, right? And we spend so much of our lives at work, for better or worse, right? I mean, broadly talking about policy and practices, policy-wise, I know many of us would like to see um, more broadly, you know, things like advocacy avenues that may establish fairer labor practices and shorter working hours or work weeks, fairer compensation, uh, minimum wage, so we can reduce the number of hours we spend at work and live our lives uh, more fully. Um, yet that's a reality in the here and now for those of us who are working, right? We're not there at those policy points yet. We can advocate for that. And what else can we do in the here and now when work is taking up a significant portion of our lives and our systems are both in trauma and replicating trauma at the same time. And so we really need workplaces that seek to acknowledge and attend to the weight of our experiences, right? Both the pleasant and the painful um, that we bring with us to work um, to reduce our sense of overwhelm and vulnerability to experiencing those compounding and cascading harms that our workplaces still tend to be causing individually and on a broader scale. And in trauma-informed workspaces, our stories are not dismissed or ignored, but instead they're met with empathy and compassion and a willingness to listen and be seen and be heard. And so that's the vision that we hope our toolkit helps you begin to think about and conceptualize and build. And having said all that, we really, again, want to emphasize a few considerations up front as you move through this toolkit. We're, again, not going to, you know, read the toolkit to you. We want you to be able to explore and make meaning of it on your own time, but just these high-level takeaways that we think are really important to anchor in in terms of what spearheading change may look like in your setting is something that we just want to talk about at a high level first. So, you know, first, this toolkit is really intended to support people in advocating for more trauma-informed workplaces, and we mean for all settings, right? This framework is not, quote unquote, just for professionals who engage in human services work or educational sector work or some of the spots that we hear um, maybe more often are thinking about this trauma-informed change. This is every community cornerstone um, from the local coffee shop to big tech firms to the federal government. Right. This is for everyone and everywhere. Um, though what's really needed to affect change, of course, is dependent upon context and setting. We are not going to pretend we are experts of what implementation looks like everywhere. You are the experts of your own setting. And so you'll be able to take um, what is meaningful to you back to your workplaces is our best hope. And similarly, any absolutely anyone in any role can stand to glean something. Um, we hope to support them in being an agent of organizational change. Um, advocacy that we at CTIP support, right, is, is not just, quote unquote, again, about federal, state, or local public policy. In fact, it must not be. We don't use absolutes very often, but it must be about more than policy. It must be about all of the pieces of change that we know are important important to create outcomes and experiences that are more trauma informed. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in, in it's important that we put our systems um, or I would say ecological lens goggles on <laughs> to conceptualize the impacts of trauma and strategize around addressing and preventing it in individual 
family, group, organizational, community, and broader world context, right? Where it's all interconnected. Consider the concept of Ubuntu, right? I am because we are, we are all nested in various systems that interface with one another and healing happens in relationship. And so there's a consideration to anchor in throughout any trauma-informed change work that this is about policy, this is about on the ground practice, this is about our interactions with our friends, our neighbors, our family members, our colleagues. It's This is about um, implementing those strategies in the workplace, but thinking more broadly about how that connects to those other pieces as well. And as we talk about this, we really want to emphasize that, yes, you know, depending on the context of your setting, you might be reaching for those specific stats included on productivity or absenteeism, presenteeism, turnover, and other figures to make your case. And we really want to emphasize that uh, this is really about so much more than that, right? And that frame can feel a little bit icky, to say the least, despite our audience's sometimes needing to hear it. We need to know our audience. What do they need to hear to be able to get on board? And also this is about honoring the full humanity and tapping into the wisdom of lived experience for each person in the workforce. Each of us knows what we need. And if all of our workplaces prioritized you know, safety, trustworthiness and transparency, voice, choice and empowerment, collaboration and mutuality, and also gave consideration to cultural, historical, and gender issues, as well as created spaces for peer support, all of us would have more opportunities to tap into what we deeply know about ourselves and to stand empowered to make choices that will help us stay present and well at work. The institutions need to allow us to be able to make those choices. Our workplaces must work for us as humans. Um, so even though, of course, that's a part of the conversation for the people that we need to advocate to, we need to understand what they value and prioritize. We also need to remember our humanity and that that's what this is truly about. About, right? We can find fulfillment in our work, and yet we are more than our work products and what we produce. We need to get our basic needs met. We need rest. We need play. We need all of those things. And right now, that's inaccessible for so many of us. And this is a major contributing factor, which brings us to that final point, right? And that's that we each have the ability to be a change maker. Each of us has a role to play. And it is through the commitment of each of us as individuals to collectively come together in conversations like this and then in action to put pressure on our systems and institutions that actually will create that change in meaningful ways. So public policy wise, again, that may be uh, working to integrate trauma informed training in all workplaces at the state level or establishing a four day or 30 hour work week to support rest or increasing the minimum wage or mandating leave time for caregivers who need time off to spend critical time for attachment purposes with cared for ones, whether an older person or a baby or child that has been added to their family system, right? There are so many policy considerations that we know are connected to this that are important. Um, and those are all possible advocacy pathways as well that we ought to be thinking about in addition to what can I do today in the setting that I am already in with the connections that I've already made? How can I be a change maker in my own organization and continue to cascade that change into our systems and institutions. And so we also want to zoom in a little bit um, to what collective action looks like at the organizational level. So how you can, um, thinking about, you know, how can you join with others to encourage leadership to make changes like the ones you see on this slide um, and that are explored in greater depth in the toolkit um, to implement change at an organizational level, to enshrine trauma-informed values and principles into the policies and procedures of our workplaces and to institutionalize them in the dailiness of how we do our work, how we think about our work, how we engage with one another as we do that work. And again, on the slides are just a few ideas, ideas from the toolkit. Um, and there are more in there with links and examples to explore and different implementation ideas and, and settings uh, that you might not have considered this being in, in the past. Um, and so I'd encourage you to really take a look at that. And also I'd encourage you to think about how you can tap into the wisdom of the community community, of the people in your organization, of people with lived experience um, to inform your efforts when you think about what you see on the slide and in the toolkit. You know, there are unique constellations of needs everywhere and 
who knows better what is needed than um, those most impacted by organizational decisions and procedures, right? What we do know is, though, in this group, regardless of the setting and what is needed for change in terms of uh, individual context, the cost of doing nothing is far greater than the cost of turning the tide, right? Ostriching and putting our heads in the sand about whatever is happening among the workforce and forgetting the humanity of who shows up to do all of that labor uh, keeps our society running in this culture that perpetuates fear and mistrust and unsafety and powerlessness and moral injury and stress and struggle. And that keeps us in survival mode, right? Further keeping that cycle going where we can't do our best work that we can feel proud of or fulfilled by because we're not supported to flourish and thrive in those settings, despite the fact that we do spend so much time there, however many hours a day we might spend in trauma. And so we must put pressure on our organizations and leaders to model this model and engage in change efforts that are sustained and meaningful and that's key to write, just as bubble baths uh, do not compensate for institutional ills that leave us feeling so overwhelmed, the occasional work pizza party is not going to address organization level and systemic harms that our workplaces perpetuate time and time again that cause people to be re-traumatized and then can cascade that impact throughout the community. And still, we do want to support you in really thinking about what your individual role in pushing the systems to change might look like. Again, we do this to help you think about what is possible on an individual level because collective action requires that each of us individually stays as well as we can to continue this change work. It is not easy. And for many of us with intersectional disadvantages and marginalized identities, it can even sometimes feel like it's threatening our livelihood to speak outright, to take certain steps. Speaking up in the workplace, depending upon a variety of factors is not going to be something that might be accessible to everybody in all contexts that you see in the toolkit, right? So really thinking about what this means for you based on where you're positioned is important here. If you're in a tenuous position and your life depends on you not rocking the boat too much, how much might you be able to prioritize taking care of yourself while also advocating with colleagues that you trust who may have more privilege or capacity or a bigger platform to take on a more forceful advocacy stance? How can you disseminate the principles and raise awareness? How can you model this model yourself and have that impact um, even if you don't have the ability to go to the leader of your organization and say, hey, do this or I quit, right? Um, if you are in a leadership role though, what will it take for you to model the model of being trauma-informed, to give team members permission to do the same for themselves? What will it really take for you to show up in that way? Um, you know, if you're setting boundaries or if you're honoring rest or if you're using time off or creating choice and encouraging others to do the same, you can create a sense of safety that it's okay for people to honor their humanity in a way that works for them. If you're in HR and you're swamped a bit and overwhelmed with even thinking about all of these things along with everything else that you're already doing, how might you be able to work with administrators to advocate for the creation of a chief wellness officer or someone else whose sole role it is to think about how to connect with folks and facilitate the work environment, meeting the needs that they express that they have? You know, there are so many different avenues for you individually to work and to join with others to affect change at that organization and systems level that we just talked about. All those points on the slide all those points in the tool can't require us as individuals to really think about what that looks like for us. How can we stay committed to pushing the systems, to disrupting the status quo? And so it's important to think about this, right? Because while we cannot pathologize or um, stigmatize um, our or a colleague's challenges with coping with traumatized and traumatizing work environments, ensuring that we as individuals remain um, aware of and notice that mismatch of what is needed for us and our colleagues to thrive and what our work environments offer people is critical to advancing change. And so that's where that awareness piece comes in, right? Because the status quo takes, I'll say, relentless work to change, we know that, power is tough to shift and yet not impossible to shift. 
It really requires that we take care of ourselves, that we think about what role we want to play and that we have the capacity to play um, and the strengths that we offer in advancing change and that we bring awareness to this and connect with others to put pressure on our organizations um, to implement sustained change to better meet ever emerging and evolving needs so people don't need to tirelessly advocate so much in the future because it will be baked into the systems. It is through us that we can hold our organizations and systems and institutions to account. Um, so it isn't just lip service, right, that each, each of us are getting. Um, each of us has the potential to make a difference and united we can challenge the narratives that those in power often use to actually justify inaction, uh, to expand achievement and well-being uh, among each of us, among our colleagues and the collective workplaces and communities in which we're nested. And so ultimately, again, Again, it's our best hope at CTIP that our toolkit supports you in identifying based on your own expertise of yourself and your work setting, what it really will take uh, to create workplace, a workplace where each person's individual story is celebrated, where the struggles and challenges that all of us have faced um, are met with a sense of understanding and support, um, a place where resources and support systems to promote holistic well-being are readily available available and equitably accessible, and where culture uh, that we work together to co-create is one that is underscored with trust, transparency, and healing. And so with that, just again, high-level overview to get your brains thinking about what this really means, what the tone of this toolkit is, what the purpose of it is as you continue to peruse through it yourself, um, we also want to lift up a couple of final aspects of the toolkit. First, we've created a podcast with Sandy Bloom as an adjunctive resource for you to really help you think about, you know, how you might join with others to mobilize your individual and organizational strengths to promote change in the workplace, and how you might be able to stay motivated through that ongoing journey. And that's found on the CTIP website. Jesse's going to drop the link in the chat for you. And finally, we really want to encourage you to share your own exemplars of successful change um, implementation, because it, the reality is that there is no one size fits all approach. We will say that again and again again, there is no end destination. And so we want to hear your stories of the challenges that you've already overcome, right? We want to hear your stories of how you've created change in your work environment, what you've seen happen, what impact that has made, what have you found to be successful, and how have you seen folks benefiting from a trauma-informed organizational change process? And so there's a link to our toolkit um, in that post as well, the, um, the, the podcast post. And Jesse, uh, maybe you could help out again by popping the links in the chat. I don't have it on my screen because I haven't sharing my screen. I'm guessing you probably have. So the toolkit as well as the podcast, just dropping that for folks to be able to access. And let's move into the breakout discussion. So I want to remind all of our brains first that as participants in this discussion, we are expected to commit ourselves to the community agreements that are on the screen. And we encourage you to review these carefully as you move into your breakout groups and really consider both how you can help hold yourself accountable to supporting a constructive and compassionate yet critical community of inquiry and discussion, as well as to let us know what else is needed, if anything, for you to show up fully in these discussions. And this is on the worksheet that we've created to help you anchor your discussions. I will drop, let me open up this chat. I will drop the link to that right there for you. This is a Google Drive document that you'll be able to download. Uh, maybe I can go ahead and actually switch to sharing that screen. That might be helpful for y'all to, to anchor in. There we go. And so this document, where's my stuff? <laughs> this document is what you'll be able to anchor your discussions in. Um, and I'd recommend also having the PDF of the toolkit or the blog post that Jesse linked to open for this discussion. Um, on this worksheet, again, in Google Docs, you can download it. You can fill it in to take notes. I included boxes there if you wanted to. You do not have to if you do not want to. Um, but I know for some of us, it's helpful to write down. I know it is for me. Um, and you can use this as a discussion, uh, an anchor for your discussion if you prefer. And you also 
can of course talk about anything else. These are basically some, some guided prompts to support you in thinking about your own personal experiences um, and translate those into what might be action steps for you in the future. And you know, how can you make meaning of and mobilize some of this information in a way that fits for you? And again, we love process here at CTIP. So we also invite you to just have an open discussion if you prefer. We just know that sometimes folks find safety in structure and these prompts can help generate discussions. So we provide them, yet ultimately we accept and appreciate that whatever happens in your breakout rooms is what's supposed to happen in your breakout rooms. And so we invite you to take whatever route you choose to take together and just know that we'll be bringing you back into this main group to share out what happened in your breakout room afterwards. Feel free to use this document if you want, um, but either way, we would love to hear someone report out from your breakout room, whichever room you're in. Um, so you may want to designate someone to be the speaker uh, before you begin your discussion, just to let you know what to expect. All right, so that's it. I am going to go ahead. I'm just going to completely randomize these. Um, let's do six to seven participants. That seems like a pretty good number. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just automate these, have great conversations. Let's do about 20 minutes. Let's bring you back at about, mm, let's do 2.40 p.m. ET. So that's actually about 15 minutes. Have 15 minutes in discussion. We'll have 15 minutes in the broader discussion. We'll do a resilience exercise and you'll be on your way. All right, have wonderful discussions. Can't wait to hear what you talk about. Room should be open now. Hi, everybody. Welcome oh. back. <laughs> yep, okay. I heard it. Oh. <laughs> oh. Can, can you hear me? Um, yeah. Is, hello. 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 Yes. Hello. Um, hey. Um, our little group. Um, I was trying to come in because we were talking about Catherine Mann and how great her book is. Mm -hmm. And how. And, we, oh, I just love her book, and I just love her, and I thank you for introducing me to her because it was during a can call probably six or eight months ago that I first heard her, or maybe it was longer than that. But anyway, Matthew Portell from Paces Connection and I interviewed Catherine last week on the History, Culture, Trauma podcast. This is Carrie Sip from Paces Connection, and Catherine did such a great job if you go to Google Podcasts and put in history, culture, trauma, he was the guest. And so for people who are hungry for more of Catherine's sane, measured, um, healing-centered, empathetic approach where she explains her laser um, mm -hmm. system of listening, acknowledging, sharing, um, empowering, and revisiting or reconnecting, um, she does a really good description of it in that interview. Thanks. That's it. Thanks, Carrie. Glad you're here. <laughs> and yeah, uh, the empathetic great. workplace. It's a great and great. <laughs> congrats on your kid. It's beautiful. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great book. She's such an asset and a wonderful resource. Everybody should go listen to that podcast. I haven't heard it, but I'm confident in saying that I'm sure it's wonderful to listen to and a great adjunct in addition to Sandy's and there's so much great content out there and thanks for lifting that up, Carrie. In addition to Carrie's breakout room, I'm curious to know y'all, what were the discussions that you had? What struck you? What were you talking about? What are you thinking in the way of action steps? Whatever you want to share, the floor is yours or put out to the main group and feel free to just unmute. Thanks, Vic. Talked about liking the approach about starting with strength. Don't you don't have to start from ground zero. Start with what's working. And we spent a good bit of time talking about the concept of safety and how you balance that with rigorous debate of ideas or discussion of ideas. How you create safety, um, knowing that some people may never feel safe. You know contributing but how you how you have those good rigorous discussions to get good ideas moved forward while also creating 
Beautiful. Love that, Teresa. Thanks so much for putting that out there. And as an adjunct, just want to plug, we have a trauma-informed discussion guide that it sounds like might be really relevant to what you talked about to adjunctively sort of supplement that. Jesse, if you might be able to retrieve that, pop that in the chat for anyone who's willing to explore, because you're absolutely right. I love the way you put it. Um, really being able to generate safety, being able to generate a sense of belonging, ensuring that everyone who wishes to participate feels safe to do so, so important in this work. Thank you so much. Who else wants to share out? I don't need to get Socratic and be like room one, right? <laughs> room, room one, room two, room three. <laughs> oh, this is Carol APS to that. Listen to Sandy Bloom's podcast with you and Jesse yesterday. That is amazing. And thank you so much for doing that. I understand so much more now. Thank you. Beautiful. Ooh, Ooh, right. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. So and Vic. Um, we yes. actually, oh, oh, sorry. I wanted to say, if you mentioned Sandy Bloom, uh, just put it out there, uh, BH10, We she actually does a trauma training for us um at least twi twice a year um so yeah very valuable work and i'll put our website in the chat if you guys are interested in hearing sandy bloom talk we generally offer them for free amazing resource thank you so much i'm always interested in hearing sandy bloom talk to be honest <laughs> well another another opportunity uh for hearing Sandra Bloom, since that's a segue, uh, <laughs> I love is, it, Thank is you. in a, uh, a film that I uh, co-produced a few years ago called Caregivers Film, Portraits of Professional Caregivers, Their Passion, Their Pain, and she's featured in that film. The website is caregiversfilm.com. But in our, uh, in our small group, um, we all felt, well, there were only three of us, but we felt that we really needed to get into the toolkit, that uh, we're all intrigued by it, uh, but that we didn't feel like we had enough uh, real understanding of it yet to be able to respond very much. Uh, we were starting to delve into it a bit through the links, but we're eager to hear more. Uh, we introduced ourselves and I'm from Philadelphia and part of the Philadelphia ACES Task Force and a subcommittee on policy. And we would love at some future point, I think, um, Jesse, maybe an email has come to you from our group just in the last hour or so. But we have also created a toolkit that has to do with secondary trauma and staff resilience. And I did just put that uh, in the chat. It's uh, it's uh, at 2.44 p.m. And it's Take Care Phil, Phil standing for Philadelphia, T-A-C-E-C-A-R-E-P-H-L dot org. And it's very accessible and uh, deals, I think, with kind of the parallel process uh, that you have been uh, addressing uh, the, the broader issue of uh, helping an organization to become trauma-informed, but that's not going to happen unless the staff itself is dealing with its secondary trauma, uh, which is uh, a real normative uh, situation in the kind of organizations we're working with. So I do encourage you to take a look also at this toolkit, TakeCareFill.org, and uh, it's, uh, it's very rich with uh, wonderful resources in this area. Fabulous. Ooh, thank you for the share. I can't wait to check that out myself. Absolutely, right? I love the way you framed. These are understandable reactions to an adverse work environment. It's understandable that that's happening. And for us to be able to have awareness and bring awareness to that and then take action to address it, so important. So thank you so much for lifting that up. And I see that there are some fans of caregivers in the chat as well. So just want to mention that and lift that up as well. <laughs> Winnie, I can do a readout. Beautiful, thanks, Laura. Yeah, so our group um, talked about a lot of different things. We covered ground for sure. Um, more time is always <laughs> wished for, right? But we, we still covered a lot of ground. We talked a lot about how um, vicarious trauma is becoming a focus with a lot of the groups and industries we either work for or represent or work with. Um, we also talked a lot about how and why it's so important to build safe and, and trust building spaces for your teams. 
Um, not only so that any trauma-informed changes that you are making within the workplace um, are lasting and integrated versus being based on one particular person in, in, in any role dictating it, right? That it's, it's, it's now sort of embedded into the organization and long lasting and sort of can serve now as like a new foundation for the, the culture and the mission um, and how you go about doing that. And we also talked about, um, you know, again, creating that space where folks can share what's working and what they would like to see changed. And someone made a comment that in their experience, you know, some of the things they want to change were very easy, right? Um, things like more flexibility with time off, whether that were holiday-based or bereavement-based or how we even define, you know, who gets bereavement for what reasons. Um, and so, yeah, it was just a really good conversation sort of about how and why that's sort of the first anchor point or one of the first anchor points in getting, getting this up and running. Awesome. Thank you so much for reporting that out. Sounds like a rich conversation. Y'all had a lot of really great conversations, even in that short period of time. I'm going to go ahead and just lift this comment up in the chat. We talked about disagreeing openly and how that can be such an important thing in a trauma-informed workspace besides creating a space of safety, trust of our clients and stakeholders. Absolutely. Being able to know that you can dissent and have no ill repercussions, so important to be able to trust that that's something that you can do. Sharon Sims, I see you have a hand raised. Please go ahead and share. Okay. So in our group, we did look at the different categories. We just didn't have time to read them all, but did skim them through. And I think some of the things that resonated was the notion of being able to lead with empathy and how important um, that is for leaders in that space. Uh, because folks are, as we know, stressed and traumatized and such an important thing. Uh, another piece that we thought was meaningful was about the establishing meaningful collaborations and how people really we're, I had mentioned, you know, none of us can do this work alone. And so how do we really help people to develop those meaningful relationships? And I think what was lifted up is that beyond just self-care, we really, uh, one of the organizations, I think it was Lindsay had mentioned in our group that they are really working on getting people to know each other, mm -hmm. to really bring in that human quality, because I think that's a lot of, a lot of that is missed, especially in the virtual world, but look, you know, just normalizing that. Um, and uh, Kali and our group also mentioned that they are really moving to this co-director model. We're really looking at not having one executive director or CEO at the helm, but having a balance where you have co-directors so that they can support and be able to get, you know, take their own self-care and be able to take vacations and be able to support in different ways, but really looking at different models for supporting leadership uh, in an organization. Wow, very cool, Cher. Thank you so much for lifting that up. I love to hear these concrete ideas. That's really neat. Thank you. What else did y'all talk about? Who wants to share out? Or ask a question, put something out there. I did share with my group, um, you know, after being um, in direct service as a clinician, for over seven years, um, full-time, right? Then, you know, we got all our part-time stuff that we do on the side because that doesn't pay enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, it's difficult in my experience anyway, and I'm in Philly, but um, I've worked predominantly in Pennsylvania. It's been difficult to find uh, someone that's, you know, in emotional recovery, you know, um, with childhood trauma. Obviously, a lot of us come into this field because we have those elements in our world, either through family or our own experience. Um, and I wasn't even taught about like vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, anything like that ever. And I'm a certified clinician in the state of Pennsylvania, right? The first time I've heard those words were like maybe three years ago, like right around COVID. That's when everybody started talking about this, right? That's how, how I feel, at least in my area, right? And I was sharing in our group, um, how grateful and how thankful I am for the organization that I currently work for, because literally everything that, I mean, I love the toolkit. And as I, as we were discussing it in our group, I was already sharing it with some of my coworkers, but I already feel like the organization that the team that I come to work with every day, we have these principles, we hold them and carry with them with us and our strategy of being mindful team members 
every day. And I'm so grateful. I literally wish I could gift my workplace culture to everybody. <laughs> me too. Um, me too. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, you know, it's very rare. So I don't want to like lose it. Right. <laughs> but um, I just want to say that, you know, having that ability to talk openly with team members um, in an inclusive space that's safe, right? And fear, without that fear of being criticized or um, even minimized or marginalized, if you have an idea, even if the idea isn't functional. In my team, everybody's ideas are welcome. Nobody's ideas are criticized. They're thoroughly discussed. There's never even like an eye roll or a batting of an eye, even if it seems outlandish or unattainable, that we still discuss it as a team. Um, and that's what I, I love about my workplace culture is that there is there's such a safe, open space without that critical element that you know, most of us that have a trauma background could prevent us from bringing really good ideas to the forefront, like what Sharon just shared. I'm taking that back to my team, Sharon, because they are so welcoming. <laughs> Ooh. Can y'all imagine if that was the culture that we had in our workplaces? How different would that be for all of us? Rachel, see you unmuted. Go ahead and share. Oh man, you got me. Um, <laughs> no, I was just gonna I was just gonna I was just gonna echo that you know I feel like within my own team I work in a really large system and I feel like we have that like my team team that I work with shares those same sort of principles and it's such a fantastic workplace but we're working within such a large system and it can feel difficult sometimes too it's almost like we have this little protective bubble that I know that not everyone else in the system gets to experience and so I'm finding that to be, you know, kind of a, a bit of a, not kind of, it's a, it's a difficulty. Um, while I'm here, just in terms of our share outs, we talked a lot about um, community and um, collective, but we did mention some coll the, the collective impact work that happens in our region and the need to sort of involve community in this work on a, on a wider scale. Um, and I'll let anybody else from my group mention anything that I have left out there. Nice. And I will say this is also my first time with this organization and on this call, and I'm already finding it so helpful. So happy to be here today. Thank you. Happy you're here. Welcome, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Anyone from Rachel's group or otherwise have anything that they wanted to add to that beautiful readout? What Tara was sharing really stuck with me and then the vulnerable bubble. Um, this is my, also my first time on this call. I was thinking about when you said principles, Tara, because my team, which was Teresa, Chaplin, Sabitri, um, we were starting to talk about principles and how we create safety. And I think the principles are what is the word I was looking for because I was thinking about as clinicians, we do that work all the time. A lot of therapy. Oh, and Jean was in my group too. Sorry, Jean. Um, we have like a parallel understanding that we're coming to the same organization with the same goals. And that makes it easy to disagree and make mistakes and grow. And so like when you were talking about your workplace, Tara, and then something about the vulnerable bubble you said, Rachel, is really sitting with me. Like, how do we take that out? And how do we model it for other people? Which I think in different ways can be activating for people who have been in unsafe spaces um, may react negatively, but I think we need grace for that as we try to bring it out of, like come from our safe spaces into a world that is not so safe all the time and understand that. And so that's what I'm thinking about in this conversation. There's just so many places this could go. So um, I really thank my, my group because we started off slow, but there was so much thinking and internal participating I could see. And I'm just really enjoying this conversation, so. Happy to chat, it's great. Nice, thanks Madison. I love that you're sort of taking us out on an action step, right? That aspect of it might feel uncomfortable for us, especially those of us who do have lived experience. So much of us come to this work for that reason to say, oh, I'm gonna make myself vulnerable and befriend this discomfort and try to disseminate this information. So it isn't just within this bubble. And also that's how change happens. So I just appreciate your leadership and putting that out there and everybody's 
participation today has been so rich and thoughtful. Somehow we're at the end of the hour already. So I want to plug that Pace's Connection helped us uh, host a blog post for this toolkit where it's interactive. You can go ahead, continue the conversation there, post your wonderments, post your thoughts, post your contributions. If there's more that you want to discuss in, in community with one another, go there. If you want to share an exemplar of implementation that you'd like us to lift up in our blog, please say, reach out to us at CTIP. Um, we have so much more on this that we could have conversations on, and I'm sure this will be a topic again in the future. But for now, I just want to say so grateful to have been in community with you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for turning this awareness into action. And we're here to support you in that. So please continue to reach out to us as we can do more of that. And we'll see you here next month for Mental Health Awareness Month to talk about collective care and trying to stay well and support each other in continuing this advocacy work that sometimes can feel so big and challenging. Can't wait to see you there. Be well till then.